Namo Buddhaya and good morning brothers and sisters. It's once again lovely to be, I'm, I always say this, but it's like a mantra. This is my favorite shrine room in the whole world. <laughs> really, really, it's, I think the circular uh, shape has something to do with it and the image, whatever. I've, I've been to so many shrine rooms, but this one lifts me up. And also seeing your faces also is, makes me very happy. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, very soon, whatever you said will be in the past tense. Uh, and why did I choose this topic, existence of evil? Because I think this word evil has a very strong resonance, not only among Buddhists, but I think all human beings are concerned with this. And to my mind, this is one of the reasons why religion was, mark my word, religion was invented. Uh, I, ha I am a strong believer in the uh, proposition that man came first, God came second. I'm not the only one who says this. Many philosophers in the West, especially in the last two centuries, have said that we came first. And when we came, and when we came, we are talking about the human being came on Earth about two million years ago. When he started standing up straight, okay, two million years ago. And then from there came something which made us humans different from all other animals, all right? Uh, that's not necessarily a positive statement. When we say some of us behave like animals, that's not fair on the animal. <laughs> I mean, they behave a lot better than us. That, why, why is that so? About 40, about 40,000 years ago, something happened with the human being in which he developed what is called self-consciousness. The beginning to think about who I am. Who am I? What am I doing? We don't think animals do this. We are the only creatures that have this concept of self-consciousness. This is a huge topic. I mean, I could spend a whole day talking about it. But for the purpose of our talk today, that evolution of self-consciousness gave rise to the idea that I am here and there is a world outside of me. So there is a, a duality. There's a world outside of me. And that gave rise, again we are talking about the invention of religion, yeah? That gave rise in human beings to a sense called noumena. All human beings have this idea that we are not alone. And we all know this, we all know this, we all have been in situations where we were alone, it was a dark and stormy night, Friday the 13th, yeah? everybody else had gone out, we are alone, and we're just going off to sleep, and we hear, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think you all have that, that, that sense. It's, it's not a real sense, but definitely we have that sense of noumena. Noumena is the beginning of religion. All, all cultures, we are not talking about which religion is right or wrong, we are talking about the human being in every culture, in every part of the world, has came up with this idea that I am not alone, that there are things around me which I can see and which I cannot see. Now, the next development from that is these things that I cannot see are very powerful. And this can be represented by thunder, lightning, rain, very macho stuff. All right, and, and this is very frightening. They are very frightening. And that's why when uh, primitive art, you know, these, uh, what you call these aborigines, do, they do art, they always make their, their statues very fierce. 
You know me, like, ah, like that, you know? Never nice and soft, gentle. Those are modern things. The, the, the modern pictures of God being gentle, that's another story. But this fear, this fearsome attribute, yeah? Then the next step from that is, of these spirits, this numina gives rise to unseen spirits, gives rise to very fierce, yeah? Gives rise to the idea that some are good and some are bad. Yeah? And that's another thing about the human being. That while we know this and these bad guys yeah, can be very fierce waiting to whack you anytime. On the other hand, there are good guys who can protect you. We develop something else with our self-consciousness. We develop our cunning our ability to escape from danger. How do we do that? We do that, beginning of religion, we, we do that by pandering to the good guys. You go to the good guys and you give him fruits and flowers and all of this and say, today you help me, tomorrow I will bring back five chickens and, you know, and that way you, bribery and corruption gets invented and all the way to Parliament House. Uh, but, 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 but the important thing is, while on the other hand, one hand there are the good guys, the bad guys have to be told stay away. Okay? And this goes on and on to cut a very long story short. All of this leads to eventually there being the, uh, the unseen world being peopled with gods. I'm using the word for the first time. These spirits that we cannot see were gods. And in the early part, uh, animism, there were many gods. There was God of thunder, God of lightning, God of this, God of that, or lots of gods. But they found these too many. So they put them into departments. <laughs> you see? Same thing, same thing. And these many gods, polytheism, slowly gives rise to monotheism. All of this, they became one chief god. And then this chief god was given the job of creation and all of this. So basically you can see that this concept of evil is tied up with this. There are the good guys and there are the bad guys. In, we are caught in the middle. And in that middle, what is it we want? From the time, 40,000 years ago, or even earlier, this concept of uh, the human being comes about. And what does the human being realize he wants more than anything else in the world? Then, as well as now, every single human being alive today has only one concern, and that is happiness. How do we can define happiness in many ways? Right? But how does that happiness come about? What do we do? What is it that stops us from getting happy? And that which stops us from getting happy, we give it a name. We call it evil. There, tada, I've come to my topic. You're wondering, you're wondering where I'm going, right? I came back, okay? So, this is the existence of evil. And what is the purpose of religion? It helps man. Oh, when, when, when I say man, please, ladies, don't worry. You are included as well, okay? Uh, this, this is a rather old text, uh. Uh, I'm, uh, okay, anyway, it helps man to understand human existence. W who am I? There are three questions all human beings ask. Doesn't matter which religion. Who am I? Who are you? How, how do the Christians see this? How do the Muslims see this? How do the Hindus and the Buddhists? Who am I? Next very important question. What am I doing here? 
Just ask yourself, what are you doing here? Get up in the morning, you know, do all this, do all that, sleep in the, through my talk, then wake up and then go and have dim sum, and then go back, go to bed, and then tomorrow get up, do the same thing, sometimes mati. After you die, you get up and say, what a pa? <laughs> what are you doing here? This, this is what religion comes in. This is what religion helps us to, to answer this question. Who am I? What am I doing here? And the last question, am I needed? <laughs> Are you needed? I mean, when you were planned, what, 40 years ago, 30 years ago with your parents, did they want you really? <laughs> uh, how many were really wanted? We are just accidents. <laughs> Am I want? And on a higher level, does God want you? If he does want you, then we can ask lots of questions about what's happening in Israel. <laughs> okay? I mean, we'll come to that later. But uh, why do we suffer? And there are two ways of looking at this question. Why, why, I want happiness. Why I don't get it? When I don't get it, that's suffering. All right? Two ways of who is to be blamed for it, or who is to whom do we ask about it? Two in the world, human beings came up with two ways of answering this question. One is homocentric. Homocentric meaning that this everything that happens in this world. It can be explained through man, through the homo, the man. That man is the center of all things. Uh, Confucius, I don't know, I haven't read the actual line, but Confucius is reputed to have uh, been asked, yeah? Uh, Master, teach us about heaven. Master teaches about heaven, and Confucius replied, why do you wish to know about heaven? Understand man. You understand man, heaven knows how to look after itself. You notice heaven doesn't get banjie, doesn't get anything. We have to sort with everything. So, and the, the, the Chinese mentality of survival is very much embedded in this. Don't, don't keep wasting God's time. Any problem, solve it yourselves. Okay? <clears throat> so that's one way of it. Buddhism falls into this. Taoism falls into this. Explain from the point of view of man. The other way is what we call theocentric, everything based on God. God created the world, God created good, God created bad, God punishes God. Everything is with reference to God. And all the religions of the world are either homocentric, Taoism, Buddhism, or theocentric, God-based. Yeah? Buddhism is homocentric. Okay? What is the ultimate aim is to find happiness. Evil, the def definition of evil, evil is anything which obstructs that happiness. And of course, every religion in the world will tell you that they promise you happiness. Is there any religion that says you come here, I guarantee you go to hell? <laughs> Everybody promises that. So actually, all religions, more or less, the same human concerns, but in different ways they are expressing it. So there's no need to say my religion is true and yours is not. We are all not. Okay? Uh, anything which obstructs that happiness is evil. Okay? Now, in the Buddhist, I think you all know this one, uh, the very famous, very beautiful uh, uh, gata, which we call the Mangala, Jaya Mangala Gata, where a, a, a deva approaches the Buddha and asks, Human beings are all the, the same question, the same question of happiness. The, this deva comes to the uh, Buddha and asks, What is the highest happiness? 
what is the highest happiness and the Buddha enumerates 38 different things which will give you that happiness. Okay, Jaya Mangalagata, uh, no time to go into it. But very practical, very down to earth, nothing to do with praying, nothing to do with just sticks. Yeah, it's to do with how you conduct, your, understand the universe and how you live in accordance with that universe, like Taoism. All right, and, 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 and how you do that, and Mangala. But the word is Mangala. So the Deva asks the Buddha, what is the highest blessing? What is the Mangala? What is it happiness? And the word Mangala is broken into three parts. Mang, woeful state. Ga, go, la, cut. Mangala, how do you cut a woeful state? I.e., how do you have happiness? And in the Buddha's teaching, there are 38 ways in which you can get this happiness. So, from a Buddhist point of view, when we talk about evil, we are also talk about suffering, which is the opposite of happiness, which is the concern of all human beings. It's not special to Buddhism alone. Okay, if you are a human, you will add, religion is what we invented, we all of us invented to answer these questions. Okay, so let's move on from there. What is the definition of evil? Having qualities tending to all negative stuff, injury, mischief, badness, worthlessness, yeah? producing sorrow, producing distress, it impairs happiness. What gets in the way of happiness? Moral badness, that is the biggest one, evil. Yeah? Today we are having a big fight going on in the Middle East, and one gang says the other gang is evil, the other gang says you are more evil than that. So both are pointing out fingers at each other, who is more evil. Why evil? Because you are morally bad. Okay, and whatever you do goes against happiness, yeah? Deviation from virtue. Whatever, don't kill, don't steal, don't commit suicide, don't uh, uh, sexual misconduct, and don't tell lies. All these are um, uh, drugs. All these are basic things that we say is good. When you don't do that, you say that is evil. Yeah? Then there's a very interesting thing, again in Buddhism, yeah, the Buddha talks about hiri and otapa. This is a very serious, uh, uh, important teaching in Buddhism. Hiri and otapa. All human beings are born with a tendency to be afraid of evil. We are born with, that means eventually we are born good. We are born good, we are taught to be bad. We learn how to be bad. This can be debated. Lah. You see, whether we are born evil and society makes you good, or whether you are born good and society makes you bad. It it's, it's, can be debated, nature and nurture. Oh, oh, all right? So it's, but hiri and otapa is what the Buddha's word for conscience. We are born with the tendency to be afraid of doing evil. Yeah? Moral shame and moral fear. Shame to do bad. Shame to kill children. Shame to blow up their faces. Shame to stop them from getting water. This has nothing to do with politics, nothing to do with war. Human being, if you want to call yourself a human being, you should be ashamed to deny a child a bottle of water, no matter whatever you want to, to say. That's hiri, moral shame, moral fear. Don't worry about God. I am afraid to do something wrong because it will hit me personally. That's why I don't do wrong. I don't do wrong because God is watching. 
I don't do wrong because I'm afraid of the consequences that it'll come on me. Hiri o tapa. So in Buddhism, what the, what the Buddha teaches us is you don't do good to please somebody outside of you. You do good because that's the right way to be. Your natural conscience gives you hiri and otappa. Okay? Right. Now, where does God come? The question that has always bugged human beings all over the world is, if God is powerful, if God created the universe, and if God created man, and if God wants us to be happy, and if God is all powerful, why does God allow evil? It's so easy for God to go to uh, Jerusalem today and say, okay guys, stop it. <laughs> oh, okay, today's a good day, Sunday. Where's, where was it? This is what a Christian priest has said. Eh? The existence of evil in the world must, the existence of evil in the world must at all times be the greatest of all problems which the mind encounters when it reflects on God and his relation to the world. If he is indeed all good and all powerful, how has evil any place in the world he has made? Why is it here? If he is all good, why did he allow evil to arise? If all powerful, why does he not deliver us from the burden? Alike, in the physical world and moral order, Creation seems so grievously marred that we find it hard to understand how it can derive from God. How can God even think of even allowing evil to exist? And this today, in the last 10 days or so, this question is the strongest uh, uh, argument that Buddhists are using. Why? Why is that evil allowed? Why is it allowed? If you, may, if you say God is powerless, God made a mistake and made us, okay, no problem. Because there's a lot of religions that say that. That evil is the dominating factor, not good. Okay? So, next question. There are two kinds of evil. Unavoidable evil, like earthquakes, disease, pests, this have been with us all along. This is what, even when we had this, uh, what, uh, uh, evolution, evolution of self-consciousness, we were aware of it. We were aware there are bad guys and good guys. Bad guys give us mosquitoes, good guys give us rain and flowers. Uh, okay, and so we, we, we live with that. Really, nobody planned it, no one God created it, it just happened. What we call evolution, it happened. Yeah? Even life, they say, was not created at one moment. It was imported from outer space, what we call transpermia. That life came from outside and colonized Earth and we are the result of that. No plan, it just happened. That way, very easy to understand. When all these, these bad things happen, okay, it's begitulah, apa lagi nak buat? Okay, and we live like that, we die, okay. But if we say that there is a good God, and we say that this good God can fight evil, why did he allow evil in the first place? That's the question we need to ask as thinking human beings. So, uh, unavoidable, there's nothing you can do about it. Okay? Or we can. Science and technology can help us. We can build uh, all, all kinds of, you know what, how science can help this one. But there is the avoidable, now think Middle East, the moral, there are moral evils which can be avoided. 
and where Buddhism comes in very strong and says, don't look outside to look to fight evil. The evil is inside of you, created by you, created by your ignorance. Convert your ignorance into wisdom, knowledge. You yourself will destroy evil. Don't, don't look outside. You destroy, you create the evil, you destroy the evil. And it can be done. That's what Buddhism teaches us. Selfishness, envy, greed, cruelty, war, corporate crime. Almost going to say politics, but I won't. Uh, all of these are man-made. And therefore, we should now turn around. Very soon we'll see how the Buddhists go about it, okay? Now, why does this happen? I remember, remember I told you about Hiri and Otappa. Yeah? These are natural, you are inborn. Yeah? All the things that have been happening in the world for the last man-made problems, for the last 40,000 years or so, yeah, we say is because and it cannot be removed by anybody because of three things, what we call chilesis, defilements. All of us human beings are born with these three defilements, loba, dosa, moha. Now, we, our ideal is nirvana. Nirvana is the absence of delusion, greed, Hatred. This is not something that was given to you by God. This is something that you were born with. All right? Delusion, that there is an I, whatever, whatever. Then, hatred, aversion, what you want, you don't get. Delusion. Okay? Loba, dosa, moha. Greed, delusion, and hatred. These we are born with, but we, and it's all in the mind, and that evil is in the mind, that evil you can remove. And of that, how do you do that? By purifying the mind. Yeah? What is purifying? What does Buddhism teach us? Do good, avoid evil. Very easy. Yeah? What cannot have happened, very difficult to do, but which must be done, purify the mind. You want to get rid of evil, that evil, you purify the mind. Each individual has to do it himself or herself. Okay? Right. Okay, what is the cause of evil? We have just said that. We, remember we said greed, hate, delusion. When there is no greed, no hate, no illusion, evil has been destroyed. And we say that the lower beings, when, if you die with all this greed, hatred, and delusion, if you die, you do nothing to clear it, and it's heavy, very strong, we feel very sorry for those people in all parts of the world who are conducting wars, who are going around you know, fighting for land and so on. We feel very sorry for them because they are so strong when they die, they will be born with more of it. And more of it means more suffering. Not only, don't worry about suffering for others, suffering for themselves. So it's, we don't point fingers at them, we feel compassion for them and hope somehow they will see through this. We are not taking sides. We are saying all human beings are there. We ourselves are capable of all of this. And we are warned that we have to take the steps to remove greed, hatred, and delusion. Because this is what will qualify you to be born as a hungry ghost. Uh, physical ills can be, clear, can be controlled by science, and we strongly believe that. Yeah? Moral evils can only be controlled by developing the mind. This is a strong Buddhist approach. Notice there's no mention of prayer. 
There's no mention of flowers, no mention of anything. Purify the mind. Do good, avoid evil, purify the mind. How difficult? Bodhidharma was going to Japan. On the way, he was stopped by a Chinese warlord. And this Chinese warlord said, who are you? He said, I'm a Buddhist monk. What is Buddhist? Oh, I heard about Buddhism. Tell me about Buddhism. So the Bodhidharma said, OK, I'll start with the four nobles. Hey, hey, hey. I am a warlord. I've got no time to listen to your Buddhism. In four lines, you tell me, what does your Buddha teach? He said, no problem, four lines. Do good, avoid evil, purify the mind. This is the teaching of all the Buddhas. Four lines. So the, the warlord says, and some more? He said, what, some more? You ask four, I give you four. <laughs> then the warlord said, oh, in that case, your Buddhism is so easy, even a child of five can understand. And Bodhidharma replied, a child of five can understand. Man of 80 cannot practice. <laughs> Especially the last one. Purify the mind. But that is the only way out. That's our stand. Okay, that's the only way out. Yeah, moral evils can only be controlled by developing the mind. Ah. Is all evil bad? Yeah? In Christianity, we have a, a concept called the fortunate fall. That it was a good thing that Adam and Eve disobeyed God and ate the apple. Okay? It's a good thing they disobeyed God because, out of, because of that, they were thrown out of paradise. In paradise, they were living like animals. You, you get food, you get everything looked after, you know. No. But once you became a human being, you had to make a choice between good and evil. You had this, uh, you had to use your human intelligence. So it was a good thing that we are suffering. It's because we are suffering that we are thinking of God. Otherwise, we'll take things for granted. That's what we call, uh, but look at it in another way. Is all evil bad? Let me start by, since it comes to my mind, why was the Buddha born in India yeah, when he could easily have been born in New York? <laughs> okay. Why was he born in India and no other place? There, was a, there is a reason why the Buddha was born. Because India then and now, no, usually because of their population problems, there is more suffering in India. There is more suffering. There is a, 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 even then and even now. Uh, okay, but if he had been born in a place where everything was good, he couldn't have become aware of suffering. You remember, he was his father protected him. And he went out and he saw the four sites. And these were not old men, uh, old age, disease, death. It's, it's not literally that. He didn't see an old man, sick man, dead man. He, he didn't. If he, if he didn't see all of this, he must have been blind. Come on, like your father was old, right? Your mother died, right? How come you tell me you never saw? Did you think of that? No. In that environment, he saw all of this, but it didn't mean anything to him. Just like you and me. We don't see any significance in that guy growing old, this guy growing old. We don't see it together. When he was maturing at the age of 29, it, these four things came to him as the basis of evil. Old age, disease, death, renunciation is the way out. He, he was born in India so that he could experience these things. He chose to be born in India, all right, where he became aware of these are the problems I have to fight. You see? 
So and then he goes back and he goes on the path as we must, once we see. Okay? So old age, disease, death, these are all evil. But this evil was necessary for the Buddha to see the truth. Otherwise, he would have been like a, 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 a puppy or a, or a cat. No, no, no opportunity to see danger. You, you get that point? Very important point. So uh, evil is not necessarily all bad because it is through the existence of evil, you apply it to the world around you as the Buddha did and your understanding will grow. Your understanding of the nature of the... That's why we Buddhists say we don't want to be born in heaven. Do you know that? We Buddhists, and as Christians ask you, you want to be born, <laughs> I'm a Buddhist. <laughs> okay, why? Because heaven is all happiness and gives you a false sense of security. And in heaven, you live for 80 million years. 80 million years living like a pup puppy dog. <laughs> okay? But here, you have good, you have evil. You will see the difference, you can make the choices. See? So, do not run away from evil, face evil, and use evil in order to see what you must see. What must you see? The delusion, the greed, the hatred. Right understanding. We need that before we can move forward. Okay? So, uh, why is it good to be born in the Manusa Loka? By the way, I need to explain this word. Manusa. Manusia. Very beautiful word. Manusia comes from the word Mano Usha. Mano, mind. Remember, we don't talk about praying, we don't talk about bribery of God and so on. We talk about the mind, purify the mind. The human being, that's why we want to be born as humans. Because with humans, we have a mind which can be developed. Animals have minds cannot develop. We have minds, as the Buddha did. Buddha had to be born as a human being, as a manusya, to develop that. And then you see the nature of evil. Then you see why it is necessary to get out of it. When that happens, you get right understanding. Okay? Right. Now, understanding grows. Why is it good to be born in the Manusa Loka? Uh, I mentioned the fortunate fall in Christianity. It was a good thing, they say, that Adam and Eve were thrown out of paradise. Because by being thrown out of paradise, they were able to exercise the free will, the choice to do good or do evil. The choice to free yourself. Okay? So it's a good thing to be born. It's a privilege. Um, what is the focus in Buddhism? Uh, we have in Buddhism Papa. The, all, all evil state is mentioned, is described as Papa. All right. Whenever you do anything wrong, we have two words for it. Uh, kusala kamma, akusala. And papa and punya. Four, four things, yeah? Kusala, akusala. When you do actions, like killing, stealing, whatever, which stops you on your, or which impedes your path towards uh, enlightenment. Once you become a Buddhist, you have decided, I'm going to follow this path. And in the process of doing this, because you are not perfect yet, you keep making mistakes. Things that stop you from your goal of attaining nirvana, we call that akusala. It is not sin. Sin is when you make God angry. God gives you rules and you go against those. That is a sin, punishable. Akusala is what we call unskillful. You do stupid things that slow you down. Now, a guy who does a stupid thing, you don't get angry with him. You feel compassion for him. But you yourself must all the time watching yourself. Am I doing stupid things? 
When you don't, you do kusala kamma, which helps you to gain enlightenment. A kusala kamma impedes your progress, pushes you backwards. Then there is two more. These are worldly concerns, not so much to do with uh, heaven, uh, with uh, nirvana. Papa and punya. We always talk about punya karma. Punya is when you do good work expecting a reward. There's nothing wrong with it. I just heard that all of you are going to go have a food cooking thing. All right? A lot of us do this. We go and give food to the poor so that next life we will not go hungry. Yeah? And we, we want something in return. When you do good expecting a return, that is punya karma. You go to heaven, which is a form of punishment. Okay? You go to heaven. Yeah? But if you same good you do for the right reason, I am giving this food because somebody is hungry. My compassion won't allow me to do this. I don't want any reward. There's no doer, there's no receiver. There's only good happening. When I do that, then it is kusala kamma. Punya kamma, doing good, expecting a reward. Then you have papa. Papa, again, is the same thing. That which, uh, things that you do, which uh, are really not connected with your path towards becoming uh, arahant. That is kusala kamma. So it's very related, many times used together, but you should know that there is a difference between the two. All right? A lot of people who do a lot of good, but they are not Buddhists and they're doing it for the wrong reason, they are doing punya. But convert your punya to understanding, it becomes kusala. Kusala leads you towards enlightenment. It's the same thing, it's good. But it, the, the nuance is separate, okay? Now, uh, associated with loba dosa gives rise to selfishness. I want to benefit from it. What the, when your understanding grows and you do not think of an I that is going to be benefit, the only reason I do whatever I do is because I want to attain nirvana. Okay? I use this body to kill the self. This is why I am doing whatever I am doing, to kill myself. Okay? My self is a capital S. Okay? Right. Um, next question. Evil comes from the mind. Please remember, this is again the great thing that the Buddha taught us, that it is in the mind Mind is the forerunner of all states. Remember the Dhammapada? If a man thinks with an evil mind, evil actions follow. Think Middle East today. Whatever reason you have, don't come and give it to me. Your mind is evil. Yeah? You are prepared to kill a little child to get a piece of real estate. You think that's very smart. Okay, I must go to United Nations like tomorrow. <laughs> but whatever harm a foe may do to a foe or a hater to a hater, an ill-directed mind can do much more worse. Don't worry about all everybody else. Watch your mind. And what does your mind tell you? Purify the mind. Purify the mind of what? Delusion, hatred, Green. Just these three. Yeah? But recognize it, see it, all right? And when that's right understanding. Right understanding leads to right thought. The way you think, that way your actions will follow. Okay? So this is, this is how we combat evil. Okay? All right. Uh, suffering is caused by ignorance. This is very important. Suffering is caused by 
ignorance meaning it is because we don't know any better that's why we don't condemn we don't punish people we don't as buddhists we we have no place in buddhism for prison we have no place in buddhism for capital punishment whatever a person does he does because he is ignorant if he knew any better he will not do what he does all the people who are in prison today if they had another opportunity or another way of being born they won't do what they nobody is willfully evil buddhist then that's why we say compassion for those who are doing things that are wrong not punishment we do not accept punishment okay now the four noble truths we are talking about evil how does evil come about the entire teaching of buddhism is summarized here yeah this handsome guy that samsara you are caught in that uh, thing and you're going round and round in samsara right in the middle you have six states of existence three happy which means heavenly and three unhappy what makes this go round and round the generator is in the middle there and what is that generator a pig a cock and a snake delusion greed aversion okay delusion that there is an i that i gives rise to my my so i am greed delusion gives rise to greed but because i can never actually own anything i will always be frustrated the snake aversion this is the motto that is driving us round and round in samsara so if you want to escape the buddha says kill the pig <laughs> don't eat it just kill it <laughs> okay kill, kill the pig kill the pig means kill your ignorance your ignorance of what that there is a person called i in here i gives rise to my all right and this my can never be satisfied so you will always be frustrated so your meaning of evil the existence of this what is the opposite of evil happiness get rid of this you get rid of this three the whole delusion of that wheel of life will disappear that is nirvana nirvana means to blow off blow off what does that mean the illusion of an existence 